Hey everyone, thank you so much for joining me on this video today. Uh, we're gonna be talking about the recent discussion between uh, Dr. Dale Allison and Dr. Mike Lacona on Sean McDowell's channel. And I'm with Lydia McGrew and Dr. Jonathan McClatchy. And Jonathan was recently on uh, Sean's channel discussing um, some of the reasons why he feels like the minimal facts isn't the best argument for the resurrection. And I really feel like this discussion between Allison and Dr. Lacona really kind of highlights some of the weaknesses of the minimal facts. We also want to take some opportunity to talk about Dr. Allison's view and offer some critiques of that. And so I'm going to bring on my guests here. Here is Lydia and Jonathan. Yeah, thank you guys so much for joining me on this video today. And uh, yeah, let's, let's dive in. So you guys both said that Dale Allison doesn't believe in Jesus's bodily resurrection. And on the stream, there was some discussion of an objective vision view, which he seems to be endorsing. Um, so what exactly is the objective vision view and how does that differ from bodily resurrection? I have a pretty good definition here of how they differ actually from Dr. Lacona's book from 2010. And I, I endorse uh, this definition. And he says, we could make a choice between an objective vision, that is, Jesus ontologically appeared to others in a manner not perceived by the physical senses, an actual appearance that occurred outside of space-time, and Jesus' appearance in his revivified corpse that was seen with ordinary vision. The former could not have been videotaped while the latter could. So that's, that's pretty good. I might tweak revivified corpse a little bit, but that, you know, I think that gives a pretty clear idea of how the two views differ. What do you think, Jonathan? Absolutely, completely uh, agree with that uh, distinction that Lacuna draws in his book. And if you look at uh, Dale Allison's book, of course, it seems quite clear that he affirms an objective vision theory. Uh, so for example, um, in, uh, on, on page uh, 283 through 284 of his book, he says, and I quote, the upshot of comparison is, for this writer, the conviction that real human experiences of a visionary nature likely lie behind the canonical accounts, despite all the later overlay. If so much of what we see in stories in the Gospels resembles firsthand testimony from other sources and other contexts, this is reason to suppose that the stories are not pure ideological constructions, but rather reflect odd things that happened. The appearances rather had uncanny features that suit visionary experiences better than everyday seeing, end quote. Uh, there's an even more um, explicit and emphatic statement um, also, um, this is on page 260 through 261, where he says, and they quote, to my mind, the enigmatic, otherworldly Jesus of the Easter stories is kin to the mysterious Jesus of John's gospel. He conceals even as he reveals. Like the um, apophatic deity, he does not correspond to familiar concepts, but instead punches holes in conventional knowledge. He is a mystery on the other side of the onto-epistemic gulf. What follows? Most early Christians operated with a simple dualistic anthropology. Human beings have or are bodies and souls. Further, they regarded the latter as imperfect and deficient without the former. And since the risen Jesus was, for them, in no way deficient or incomplete, and since they believed this tomb to be uh, his tomb to be empty, they thought of him as having a material body in his risen state. What counts in the end, or so it seems to me, is not the metaphysical or ontological status of the bodily form of the enigmatic post-Easter Jesus, something nobody can know anything about, but the personal identity of the risen one. With the crucified Jesus of Nazareth and the circumstance that whatever else he seemed to be, he was not an, an instantial, in, insubstantial ghostly relic the defeated victim of death, what is the advantage of an interpretation of the resurrection so literal that it forces the conclusion that the risen Jesus retained his kidneys and genitals, had a body full of carbon and oxygen atoms, and swore to the material costume? Traditionally, most Christians have believed that at some point, Jesus passed into a new mode or sphere of existence. I see no theological deficit in supposing that this happened before he appeared to Mary. Peter, end quote. So that is, that's uh, Dale Allison's uh, understanding of the nature of the resurrection. And as you can see, uh, quite clearly, it fits much more nicely with uh, what Lacona described as the objective vision hypothesis. And that is, I think, a, a contrary position to the traditional uh, Christian perspective that Christ uh, was raised on earth in a bodily form. And, and so I think that we ought to get away from calling 
and um, and describing Dale Allison as a, a Christian, because uh, in a creedal sense, a Christian affirms the bodily resurrection of Jesus on earth. That is foundational to certainly Paul's gospel, and uh, and so we we have to um, be careful to to affirm the creedal definition of what a Christian actually is. Yeah, yeah, it's not just a compliment. Calling somebody a Christian isn't just <clears throat> paying him a nice compliment, you know. That that long quote that you just read to me is so revealing in so many ways. And uh, in a minute here, we'll probably play, play a clip from the stream. But I, I can really hear a, a certain amount of contempt there when he says, uh, you know, retained his kidneys and genitals and uh, sported a material costume and that kind of thing. You know, he's very much, very dismissive of it. And notice when he says that he wasn't a ghostly relic, that's just in a theological sense. So the whole point is that when they were affirming that Jesus was raised bodily, the theological import of that is just that he wasn't deficient and that he wasn't a defeated victim. It's all the sort of ideological meaning but it doesn't really matter. They were just mistaken in thinking it was important for him to have a literal body full of carbon atoms. Of course, they didn't know about carbon atoms, but you know, a, a body you could videotape or whatever. And so what he's essentially doing is encouraging us to affirm that Jesus was in no way deficient um, and he wasn't defeated, but in other senses, he might've just been what we would normally call a ghost, namely somebody who doesn't have a, a literal physical body. Um, another thing about that lengthy quote is that he um, is explicitly blurring the ascension and the resurrection. So he's saying that uh, most Christians believe that Jesus, you know, eventually uh, entered into a new mode of existence, that he's talking about the ascension here. In a different part of his book, he refers to it as a parallel universe or something like that. You know, he went to heaven. Um, and then he says, well, you know, I, th I think it would be just fine to affirm that that happened before he appeared to any of them. So basically, all the appearances are the same. They're all visionary in nature. They're all like the appearances that we would call after the ascension when Jesus was no longer on earth. And that's what we're supposed to, um, you know, be content with because otherwise we're being so crude in thinking that Jesus still had kidneys and genitals. So, um, and he, he didn't say anything that contemptuous in the video stream, but he did say something that pretty clearly endorsed the objective vision view. You want to run that clip there, Eric? Yeah, sure. Mike, now I know you agree with this. You spent a lot of time in your book on 1 Corinthians 15, the creed, uh, verses really three through seven. And so you would agree with Allison on this. Maybe let's move to a little bit of areas where we might start to disagree. Now, Dale, maybe it'd be helpful if you could explain to us, you have a line in your book where you said, I believe that the disciples saw Jesus and that he saw them. Could you clarify for us what you mean by that? And why? Okay, so so the, the reason I'm saying that is that in the book, I have two chapters on visions. And I'm not trying to be re reductionistic there, but I end up saying that uh, maybe uh, these accounts were visionary, or when I'm hedging my bets, I'll say something like vision-like, okay? And when you use the, the word vision uh, or vision-like, given our time and place and culture, people are just going to think hallucination. And that's not what I mean by vision. So uh, I think it's possible, uh, not just with regard to the, the stories about Jesus, but I think it's possible in general for there to be veridical elements communicated in what we, we call visions. So I don't think all visions are hallucinations. And by the way, I don't think Christians can think that because there are lots of visions in the Bible in which uh, people think uh, God has uh, communicated to them, right? So, um, that, so that line is, first of all, an attempt to say, even though I'm going to be using at points the language of vision or comparing things in the Gospels with visions, that doesn't mean uh, I'm on the side of the people who want to dismiss them all as, as hallucination. And I thought the, the easiest way to do that would just say, would be to say the disciples didn't just see Jesus, but he saw them. So it's somehow a two-way uh, encounter. Now, just for clarification before I come back to Mike, when you, when you talk about vision, 
you made a reference that there's visions in the New Testament that clearly within the text of the New Testament, Paul would think are a kind of supernatural experience. When you say visions, do you mean a supernatural kind of experience or not necessarily even in that sense? Uh, so, so that's a great question. Um, what I'm intending and what I just said was to, to indicate that some visions, in my judgment, are veridical. Now, then the question becomes, how can visions be veridical? And I think there's more than one answer to that. You can speak of God as the source of some visions, but I think other visions um, have um, metanormal sources that I don't understand, but they're still not uh, subjective. So I think, for example, just to be personal and candid, I think sometimes when people see the dead, they're not just hallucinating, right? Now, how you throw God into that, um, I'm, I'm not always sure, but I still think that sometimes people see uh, the dead. So, yeah. Okay. It's pretty clear there. Yeah. And I find that there's maybe a little too much excitement about the objective side of objective visions. Like everybody goes, oh, thank goodness he's not seeing hallucinations. Well, I mean, so what? He's also not seeing yeah. bodily resurrection, right? You know, mm -hmm. I mean, he's, he's emphasizing that it's objective, but it could be metanormal, paranormal. Um, it's veridical, but, but he's very clear that it's not physical. And in fact, in that quote that Jonathan read, he says, we can't know anything about um, Jesus's metaphysical status. Well, traditionally Christians have thought we could at least know about it, that in, it is in a, in a very usual sense um, bodily. And I think that's why Dr. Lacona put into his definition, you could videotape it. The way I'll sometimes put it is I'll say, if someone else had accidentally walked into the room where Jesus was appearing to his disciples, that person would have seen him too. It's not like he was just revealing himself in a visionary way to only certain people who were specially called, but he was literally there just the way that if you walk into a room and I'm in the room, you can see me even if you don't like me or something. You know, you don't have to be my friend in order to see me in the room. So um, I think we have known something or believe that we've known something about the the metaphysical nature of the risen Jesus who met them on earth, but um, Dale doesn't think you can, and I don't think we should be so, you know, desperate for, well, at least this and at least that, to make a big deal about the fact that he thinks that they were veridical. We, we get that, but yeah. then there's still visions. Right. Absolutely, and, and there's actually a quote in the book where Dale Allison uh, imputes this very weird view on the resurrection to Ben Witherington, who's a conservative evangelical scholar. Uh, and he says, and I quote, this is on page 273, in the words of Ben Witherington, to date there has been only one example of resurrection on this planet. If by this, he means that Jesus is the only individual whose dead body has disappeared from this world and moved into some parallel universe or realm of being, then what of the trunk pro, trunk report? He's referring to uh, his uh, stuff about uh, rainbow bodies and so forth. But uh, I mean, Walt Christian thinks uh, or shares this really weird conception of what the resurrection entails. Uh, and so to just impute this to Ben Witherington is very, very odd. Well, it's almost like he's trying to he's trying to co-opt it. You know, probably if you pinned him down, he'd say, nah, I know that isn't what Ben Witterington means. He'd probably just say, I think that's what we should mean by resurrection. And what he gives there as a definition is a pretty good definition of the ascension, right? That his body disappeared from this earth and entered into a, a parallel realm of being. Yeah, that's pretty good for, you know, for the ascension. But he's very deliberately melding those two together. Um, and so it's like, no, 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 Dale, you're, you're off by like 40 days. You know, we, we Christians would affirm that that happened, but that's not what we call the resurrections. And so then there's an intervening period where Jesus is actually on earth that appears to people on earth. So, yeah. Right. So how does this relate to Jesus's appearance described in the Gospels? I mean, obviously those look extremely physical. Um, they're touching Jesus. They're eating with Jesus. Like you said, they're over a period of 40 days. Um, and so obviously those appearances aren't supposed to be non-physical 
visions, even though they appear physical. I mean, Allison's not saying that, obviously. And so, um, you know, how, what does Allison think on these things? And then, like, con contrast it, I guess, with your thoughts or, yeah. Yeah, yeah well, I mean, Allison's super explicit that those parts of the narratives are invented. Mm -hmm. So he doesn't, so like when Tim and I wrote our big resurrection article and we dealt briefly with objective visions, you have to remember that we were taking it that the reports in the gospels represented what the disciples claimed. So we dealt chiefly with the absurdity of imagining an objective vision that has all of those highly physical properties. I mean, that would be very bizarre, you know, or they're like passing Jesus fish and, you know, all of this and meeting his groups and he's giving them these long, long sermons and so forth. But it's far more convenient to the objective vision view to uh, trim out certain parts so that you don't have to postulate something that extreme or that weird. And that's exactly what uh, Dr. Allison does. So for example, on page 66, he says that Luke 24, uh, 36 to 43, and John 20, 26 to 29 are, quote, probably a version of Jesus' appearance to the 12 expanded for apologetical purposes. And he's all, also very explicit that the doubting Thomas thing has been expanded for apologetical purposes. He says it sounds defensive, quote, unquote, uh, put your finger and, and uh, touch, see my hands and so forth. Um, and then even when he's talking about acknowledging an appearance to the 12, uh, he says, did they all say the, see the same thing? To ask such questions is to realize how little we know. Well, obviously, we only know that little if we take it that the reports don't tell us what they claimed. And he goes on, if let us say two or three of the disciples said that they had seen Jesus, maybe those who did not see him but thought they felt his presence would have gone along and been happy to be included in, he appeared to the 12. So that just shows us how someone can acknowledge a group experience, but but strip it mm -hmm. of its quote unquote apologetically helpful sections. In fact, I would say that from Dr. Allison's perspective, the more apologetically helpful something is, the more likely it is to be made up which is a, you know, if, if you're a Christian apologist, you should kind of know that about him, that if something is going to be of any help to you, he's going to take it out of the realm of um, of really being what was attested. So I think that's how he would navigate that. Right. And as, as I said in the interview I did on Sean McDowell's channel concerning uh, the Allison and Michael Lacuna's dialogue, um, Mark, Mark's gospel uh, ends very abruptly in verse 8 of chapter 16, and we don't know how it ended or if it ended or whether whether he ended at verse 8. Uh, scholars disagree over uh, whether there was an ending that's been lost or whether Mark, in fact, intended to finish there. But regardless, we don't, it, we don't have a resurrection narrative in Mark chapter 16. And so we don't know how Mark would have ended had he included a resurrection narrative. We don't know what details would be included there. And so you're comparing apples and oranges when you try to compare Mark's resurrection narrative with what we have in Matthew, Luke, and John, where there is a resurrection narrative. And Matthew and Luke probably were written around the same time and don't seem to be literarily dependent upon one another. It doesn't seem that Luke is borrowing from Matthew. And uh, th there are certain variations between Luke and Matthew that suggest independence, that, that they don't seem to be giving uh, the same, um, uh, borrowing from the same source. For example, Luke mentions the appearance in Jerusalem, whereas Matthew mentions the appearance in Galilee. Um, and uh, and so given that Matthew and Luke are, see, seem to be independent, at least on the resurrection accounts, then the only interesting data point from the perspective of a developmental hypothesis is that John has more details than Matthew and Luke. So you've only got two data points on which to base your argument, which is not a very robust um, way of arguing. And um, and then we've also got, of course, an avalanche of positive confirmatory data that indicates that um, all four of the Gospels are are the, the authors are habitually scrupulous, that they are trustworthy uh, uh, substantially, and the, that that itself provides us a prima facie reason to trust what they're saying, that mm -hmm. these authors are in a position to know what was being asserted by those who were eyewitnesses if they were not eyewitnesses themselves. 
Yeah, doesn't Dale Lydia say something to the effect in his book when he's addressing you and Tim's article on the Blackwell Companion that you assume the facticity sure. of these narratives? I mean, okay, well, the that's appearance to Thomas in particular, yeah. was all of them, including the appearance to Thomas. Yeah, mm -hmm. he doesn't get the idea of assuming or taking it. I mean, we're prepared to argue, but that these represent what was claimed. So he mm -hmm. comes pretty close to uh, accusing us of question begging. Now, not to be unfair, frankly, I'm sure he'd have just about as much dismissive feeling toward what we really were doing as mm -hmm. toward what he thought we were doing. I'm not sure that would make a big difference to him, but I, I don't think he did correctly understand the, the form of that argument. And there was a, an, another interesting misunderstanding that, um, occurred when Jonathan was on uh, Sean's show recently. Unfortunately, you know, we took the opportunity to clarify that in um, like the comments and, and so on, but we can put it out here as well. When hmm. Jonathan said to, um, and you can, you know, correct me if I'm wrong here, Jonathan, but I've checked this with you already. When, when he said that there's only two data points for the developmentalist thesis, what he meant was to deny the developmentalist thesis. It's not that, well, there's a little bit of development, legendary development, but not very much. And um, Sean kind of tried to summarize, and I'm sure he didn't in any way mean to misrepresent. Mm. I think it was just a genuine misunderstanding. Sure. As So, you know, you think there's some, uh, you know, I forget the word he used, legendary development but not as much as people would assume. And I think it just went past too quickly. And Jonathan didn't, you know, like, wait, what, what did you just say? You know, um, because the whole point of saying that there's only two data points is to say, so this is just a terrible argument. There right. isn't any, there isn't any legendary, you know, yeah. development. So it's good to, you know, to clarify that. But, but Dr. Allison, you know, I don't even know if he's concerned to draw, you know, a line of development, but he just does think that those, highly physical portions, the very fact that they're highly physical. So he says, for example, about the appearance to um, Thomas, um, converting a doubter in a story is a way to address doubts in one's audience. Maybe the narrative sought to allay the suspicion that the disciples hallucinated or saw a ghost. So anytime something sort of does allay a suspicion that they saw a ghost, he's like, well, maybe it was made up for that purpose. Mm -hmm rather than acknowledging that they are, you know, what was actually uh, claimed. One, one other point I'll make that's relevant to the developmental hypothesis and my earlier comments concerning the independence of Matthew and Luke is that Michael Lacona actually thinks that Luke is redacting Matthew, or at least a shared material with Matthew. And for in, in his debate with Bart Ehrman in February of 2018, he says that Luke essentially moved the meeting with Jesus to Jerusalem. Michael Lacona believes that the earliest appearance of Jesus to the disciples was in Galilee. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe, and Lydia believes, uh, that the earliest appearance was in Jerusalem. That's quite explicit in John's Gospel in particular, also in Luke as well. Um, and so Lacona argues that Luke moved the appearance to Jerusalem when in fact it was in Galilee. And so Michael Lacona says in this debate, I think that that first appearance probably happened in Galilee, but Luke situates it in Jerusalem. And Ehrman responds saying, so the appearance was in Galilee, but Luke says it was in Jerusalem. And you think that's accurate? Of course, Ehrman is very astute and he recognizes that this is a very strange definition of accuracy. Mm -hmm. And Lacona says, yes, he, he affirms uh, that this is an accurate description of the first resurrection encounter. And Ehrman asks Lacona, what would make it inaccurate? <laughs> Lacona says, um, he appeared to them in Africa. <laughs> and so, I mean, I mean, think about how much damage this does to the apologetic yeah. or the resurrection yeah. to say that the author has just had, um, that they, they were at liberty to deliberately change the facts. And, um, I mean, and Ehrman correctly points out in the discussion that, this isn't, I mean, because Lacuna was trying to represent this as um, as, a tel as telescoping, which is a legitimate uh, literary device. I mean, there, there are ancient authors telescope or collapse narratives or condense narratives all the time. But this isn't a matter of telescoping. This is changing the location. You can telescope without changing the location. Or um, the time. 
You can telescope right. by narrating achronologically, mm -hmm. which is exactly. what I would have talked about. Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. I know. It's 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 really a problem. And since that, since you brought that up, I thought I would. Um, and I'm doing a little series on David Friedrich Strauss right now. My my video that just dropped today on the day that we're recording this was Tim uh, reading a a wonderful old commentary on on Strauss and. Um, the the argument that Dr. Lacona gives and why are there differences in the Gospels for that reaction, it's actually several pages long. I mean, it's a pretty detailed argument. And I don't think this is a coincidence. I don't think Dr. Lacona was consciously invoking the method that Strauss uses, but I think it's become habit in New Testament scholarship to mm -hmm. use this method. Yeah. It's right down the Straussian line, because what you do is you start with two narratives that appear to be quite different on the face of them because they appear in they occur in completely different places right then you notice some similarities um like that some doubted it says in matthew you know when they met him which i think is evidence that it was a larger group mm. um mm. and in luke it says when they were unbelieving for joy he asked if they had any any food right but that doesn't have to mean it was the same appearance at all so you notice some similarities then you would say okay so this these are redactions on the same event hmm. but then you go back to the fact that they're in totally different locations and you say oh they're hopelessly contradictory so like, that should have been a clue from the beginning that it wasn't the same event then you wouldn't have a contradiction at all Right? right, so that's right. very common. Uh, Johannes Ebrard makes fun of that in Strauss, and it's very poor methodology. Something I've noted, and I've never seen Dr. Lacona address this, is that there would not be time for the doubting Thomas narrative if that were the case. You mm -hmm. can't imagine doubting Thomas going to Galilee. Well, hey, Thomas, it's only a four-day walk. Come on, you know. Um, maybe we will see Jesus. You never know, right? And he goes along with them and they all see him up there. And then are we supposed to think he appeared to them and Doubting Thomas wasn't with them? And then the later appearance to Doubting Thomas also occurred in Galilee? I mean, it's just impossible, I think, in any reasonable way to assimilate that sequence that John gives of Doubting Thomas, which John firmly locates in Jerusalem, to a first appearance of uh, up in Galilee, I don't know that Dr. Lacona's ever really, you know, addressed that. I know he hasn't addressed it publicly, but I don't know what he thinks about it. But it is a it is a real apologetic problem. And it's one reason why these details are actually important, because obviously doubting Thomas has apologetic importance. So right. Yeah, I and mean, then this is why we address these things. It's not that we're like I, I see so many people online, they kind of are like, why why are you addressing Dr. Lacona like this? And why are we contending, you know, against minimal facts and, and the maximal data and different things like that? Now, I know that Lacona's view doesn't, isn't necessarily entailed by the minimal facts with his views of the Gospels, but there is kind of some relation there. And so this is a pretty high stakes deal if we don't know what the appearances were like, and then they become all blurred with all this like strange redaction. And, and if there's going to be embellishment, and you're admitting that they're embellishing. I mean, this is exactly where it would be, you would think. Um, and so this is why we address these things. And so um, moving on, if Jesus just appeared in visionary experiences to the disciples, and if the strongly physical aspects of the gospel stories are made up, obviously that's a huge problem relating to how Jesus was raised bodily. And so does this mean they didn't really believe that he was raised bodily, that he only appeared to them in visions? I mean, that was... It, it seems like that's kind of that, that's definitely what it seems like Allison is saying. Well, and it so, seems like what you might think he'd be saying, like, OK, then what did they actually believe? He actually addresses that. Maybe you could run that next clip that yep. uh, I think where he kind of addresses this. Yep. Well, so I, I would add something that is re that I think is really important to this. So first of all, uh, if you look at what resurrection generally means or almost always means in, in uh, early Judaism, it has to do with bodies and tombs and dust and graves. <clears throat> it's Ezekiel 37 type stuff taken literally. 
Um, so that's, that's, that's the first thing. But the second thing is, is that, and here I'm going to agree with Mike, but I probably would go a different way. I think there is a foundation for the passion predictions in the life of Jesus. So I think Jesus uh, speaks of resurrection before Pentecost. I think Jesus speaks of resurrection before he's crucified. <clears throat> and I think his disciples pay attention to him. And I don't think they were 100% amnesiacs uh, right after the crucifixion. So I think the category of resurrection is given to them before these events. And so th the way I would put it together is I would say you need three things uh, for this early Christian resurrection belief. I think you need this tomb. I think you need encounters, and whether you know subjective or objective or, or some, something else. And then you need the category resurrection, but I think it's already given to them, handed to them by Jesus. Now, um, I don't know how Mike understands. Um, for me, you can't just draw this line at the crucifixion and say these things happened and that's why they thought so and so. Okay. Oops, sorry. Let me get you guys back. Um, yeah, and so I kind of spliced a couple things together. So go back, watch the whole thing in its entirety, in its context. But there was a couple things that he said together that kind of went together. So I'm sure you, some of you watching caught up on that. Uh, no sneakiness there. Just watch the video and find out for yourself. But um, so, yeah, like, there what he, he seems lays to be it saying out. is they did believe it, mm -hmm. but only because they were expecting it. Okay, right. so he's, he's it, so Allison, I think, would agree that they believed that he was raised bodily. And I think that that um, comes out in his book as well. But remember in the long quote Jonathan gave, most early Christians operated with a simple dualistic anthropology and Jesus would be deficient if he weren't raised bodily. And then in this clip, he referred to the Jewish conception of resurrection, which has to do with all this literal physical corpses and stuff. So I and he said, you need all of those things. It's not just that they believed it because it happened. Right. Mm -hmm. So his point is that they were believing it, but the phenomenological properties of their experience were not the major reason that they believed it. they believed it because they they had this expectation from jesus passion predictions and they had a jewish conception of resurrection and um he also mentions that he believes they did find the tomb empty and and then they had some kind of experiences but again vision like experiences so if they just gone by what the experiences were like they wouldn't have thought he was risen from the dead it's because of all this other stuff put together that they think he, they really did believe he was risen from the dead. In other words, they were not rational. I mean, from right. from our perspective, I mean, he probably wouldn't like that phrase. They were not rational, but that's how I would summarize what he's really saying. Right. Yeah. I, I, I would agree with Allison and Lacuna, for that matter, that Jesus predicted ahead of time his impending death uh, and his subsequent resurrection from the dead. Um, for example, in Mark 14, 57, 58, and Matthew 26, verse 60 and 61, where Jesus before Caiaphas and the false witnesses step forward saying, we heard this man say, I will destroy this man, we temple and rebuild it in three days, but not by human hands. That um, That's an unexplained illusion in Matthew and Mark. There's no further pretext that provides background to that accusation. It's a very pretty serious charge in the context of first century Judea. And it, it, the readers just left hanging as to what Jesus actually said. Uh, there's no explanation or further elaboration in the text. Now, if we go over to John's account, later gospel, uh, independent of the synoptics, uh, in John chapter 2, verses 18 and 19, after Jesus has cleansed the temple towards the beginning of his public ministry, the Jews ask him, what sign do you show us to prove his authority to do these things? And he says, destroy this temple, and I will raise it up in three days. And of course, it turns out he's speaking about his resurrection from the dead. And, and so that provides the pretext that makes sense of the misrepresentation of Jesus' words. Notice he never said anything about destroying a man-made temple, or rebuilding in three days, but not by human hands. Um, and then in John, if you can read John to the end, and you'll never find the a reference to that misrepresentation of Jesus' words. So neither of those appears to be borrowed or copied from, from the other, they, this, it seems to be anchored in historical memory. Another example is in Mark 8, where P Jesus is predicting his 
death and resurrection. And Peter takes him aside and rebukes him, saying, Lord, this will never happen to you. And Jesus says, get behind me, adversary, or Satan, um, for, for you have in mind not the things of God, but the things of men. And it seems unlikely, particularly if Mark is basing his material on the eyewitness source of Peter, which is what the patristics believed, then it seems unlikely that Mark would have included that as a fictional detail, because it's uh, it's it's the criterion of embarrassment there at that point. Um, now, what the way that Allison wants to take the argument is that, therefore, that makes it more likely that because they were predisposed to believe that Jesus would be raised from the dead. Mm -hmm. And so that undermines the fact that the case that Jesus, in fact, was raised from the dead. But you have to bear in mind, if you read the resurrection accounts carefully, that the disciples were quite skeptical of the resurrection, even though they'd heard these resurrection predictions they didn't really understand that he meant literally until after the fact. Uh, in Luke, for example, when the women report the empty tomb, it says at first they didn't believe the women for it seemed to them like nonsense uh, and, uh, and so forth. And, uh, and so even though they, they heard these predictions, I noticed that some, they're, they're often cryptic and, and uh, they, they weren't, I think, properly understood even in the immediate situation. So when Jesus says that he'll destroy the, the temple uh, destroy the temple and i will rebuild it in three days the jews respond saying it's taken us 46 years to build this temple and you'll raise it up again in three days and of course they misunderstand him and so that that seems to me to be a, a valid response to to alice's argument at that point no i i agree and actually to be fair i believe dr lacona does say but it doesn't seem like they did expect it you know he does come back with that which i think is is a good response although there again you're alluding to something that's reported in the gospels so you know if somebody thinks that those narratives were embellished i'm not sure quite how you're going to insist that they didn't expect it because that's coming from the narratives um but i i think in a sense that um dr allison has a lot of um tolerance for human what i would call human irrationality but he wouldn't call it that because he's not trying to be judgmental about that, right? Mm -hmm. um, he just thinks people believe a lot of weird things and sometimes they're right, sometimes they're wrong, and it's hard to be sure. And so in a sense, he's not judging the disciples for believing this with insufficient empirical data, but he's just saying, um, you know, he doesn't think they had sufficient empirical data. They just had um, not only the predisposition from the predictions, but also this Jewish concept. Um, but he also applies it kind of globally. So um, I'm going to verbally cite this. He says um, at minute 52, this is in the stream. He says, it's just that at this point, even though this is the center of Christianity or Christian theology, speaking of the resurrection, that doesn't for me mean that you can establish it historically. So he's very explicit that the resurrection cannot be established historically. And I think there he may be even including objective vision. I think he may not even be restricting that mm -hmm. to bodily resurrection, but so much the more, since he doesn't believe the bodily resurrection, you, he'd say you can't establish that historically. So I think that's kind of important um, from, if, if someone is an apologist and is gonna say, no, I think we can establish it historically. We need to ask, okay, what what is our answer there mm -hmm. um, to Dr. Lacona's position? And I think a, a big answer we need to have is, well, if these gospel narratives, I think these gospel narratives do record what they said. And in that case, I think any reasonable person would believe he was raised from the dead right. bodily. That would just be the reasonable thing to believe. You, It, it has got it doesn't have to have to do with a, a simplistic, dualistic anthropology or uh, mm -hmm. Jesus' passion predictions even. Even Je Jesus' passion predictions aren't even necessary for mm -hmm. them to believe that he had risen from the dead. They believed he rose from the dead because they they had these incredibly physical experiences with him. And, and I think that's the direction we need to be going uh, sort of apologetically. Yeah, I mean, I think that's why he, he makes these comparisons, you know, you got rainbow bodies and Marian apparitions and things that, you know, there's certain Marian apparitions that got a lot of like, attention in the news and different things like that. And he's, he's he'll just basically say, well, if we have so much modern evidence for some of this stuff that I don't personally find compelling, then I can completely understand why a skeptic would find what we have um, as far as what he's concerned, the Christian evidences are 
um, to not be compelling, even though he seems to kind of in his own wishy-washy way, sort of believe something happened. Um, is, do you think that's a fair assessment there? Well, I, th I think he believes that something at least meta-normal, for one of his favorite words, did happen. Mm -hmm. You know, and frankly, I, I think Jonathan may have made this point when he spoke to Sean on his channel. The fact that Dr. Allison has these meta-normal categories actually gives him sort of more things to reach for, right? Because yeah. um, I think he... he so he gave this uh, interview with Dr. Lacona back in 2021, um, maybe a year and eight months ago, something like that, where it was like a three-part interview. It was good and long. And he said that I, he's four people all in one. And I, I don't know if I'm going to remember all the four, but um, one of them was a skeptic and thinks we don't know anything. And one of them is a rationalist who's, you know, trying to, you know, be super rational. One of them is what he called a Fortean, and you can look that up. I think it's F-O-R-T-E-A-N. So Fortean phenomena are um, um, paranormal, you know, phenomena. And he said, and as a Fortean, I just believe all kinds of weird things happen, you know. And then the fourth Dale was the one who goes to church and prays. And he called that the Christian Dale. And these are all in one. And so I think that's a pretty fair uh, self-description. And so as a as a Fortean, I, I think he, he believes in the resurrection, sort of, you know, as a, as a Fortean phenomenon, at least, you know, mm. um, but not, not bodily in nature. And so he probably thinks that at least some of those Marian things and rainbow bodies probably do happen, though, um, you know, once you flatten it all out, then you're basically just shrugging your shoulders about all of it. You're right. kind of saying, well, I don't know which of these are vertical and which aren't. Um, all right. So we've been discussing Dale Allison's view uh, regarding the nature of the resurrection um, and on the gospel accounts regarding the resurrection. Um, how does all of this relate to the difference between the minimal facts and the maximal data approach? Go ahead, Jonathan. Okay. Uh, so, so the um, so I, I think that... Uh, Dale, I think that Michael Lacona's uh, arguments for the resurrection are vulnerable to some of the critiques that Dale Allison makes. Uh, so Dale Allison, of course, uh, believes in the paranormal. And so that gives him more resources from which to draw. Uh, if we're not able to say with confidence what the alleged experiences are supposed to have been like, then it becomes very difficult to evaluate the rationality of the disciples' belief that the best explanation of what they saw is that Jesus was raised bodily from the dead. And um, furthermore, I think there's a problem when it comes to limiting oneself to the Pauline corpus in presenting one's argument for the resurrection. Uh, in particular, stress is laid by minimal facts apologists on 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 7, uh, where Paul uh, gives this uh, what most scholars believe to be a pre-Pauline creedal tradition, uh, where he mentions the appearance to Cephas and the Twelve and, and to, to James and all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one intently born. And De Allison, in the discussion with Lacona, rightly points out that it's difficult to make a strong argument on the basis of the Pauline corpus that Paul's experience was qualitatively different from that of the other apostles. In fact, Dale Allison doesn't think they were qualitatively different. And this is, Dale Allison, of course, is not unique in thinking this. Gerd Ludemann says the same thing, for example. And while one can make some arguments in relation to that from the Pauline corpus, I don't find them to be decisive. And I think if you want to make a really decisive argument, then the best approach, in my judgment, is to argue that the book of Acts is in fact written by a traveling companion of the Apostle Paul. Because if, in fact, he was a traveling companion of the Apostle Paul, and he was present with Paul and Paul's journeys in particular, when Paul goes to uh, visit the uh, Jerusalem church in Acts 21, where it mentions that all of the uh, elders, all the Jerusalem leaders, including James, were present. And of course, Luke was, was present with Paul during Paul's imprisonment in Caesarea Maritima for at least two years. And so he would have had ample access to that, uh, to, to those living witnesses of the resurrection or supposed living witnesses to the resurrection. And so he was in a position to know 
what was being asserted by those who are in in the know or in the position to know um uh, he, he was in a position he, uh, luke was in a position to know what was being asserted by those who were purportedly eyewitnesses of the resurrection and and so, and luke of course shows himself time and time again to be a very scrupulous historian with a very he has great care for factuality and this he demonstrates this time and again reading through the book of luke and, and the sequel to luke the book of acts and if paul if, if luke took a fundamentally different perspective or had a very different understanding of what the resurrection actually was what the experiences were actually like than that of paul that would be very very surprising if in fact he was such a close companion of paul and so we can actually use luke to shed some light on what Paul plausibly means, or very likely means, very probably means, in First Corinthians 15, 3 through 7, when he mentions the appearance to the other apostles and last of all to himself, that those that are not, they're not all, although Paul's experience had vision-like qualities, the, and, and indeed was veridical, as I mentioned in the discussion with Sean, the experience of the other apostles was far more veridical even than Paul's experience. It was, it was, it appeared more physical. Well, right. And if you just read from Luke to Acts, you have the narrative of the ascension in Acts 1. And so, um, once again, if that's supposed to come from people that, you know, were supposedly actually present, what you see is them sharply distinguishing something that Dr. Allison views as being not sharply distinguished. Namely, when Jesus was literally walking around and 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 eating and drinking and uh, having long conversations during that time on earth, during that 40 days. And then what happens after that, after he goes to heaven, you have like Stephen, for example, saying, I see the heavens open, Jesus at the right hand of God. So that those are, those are different in kind. Mm -hmm. But um, it, as you're saying, that depends on taking Luke to have really researched what these people were really saying as opposed to just sort of making up the ascension after the fact to explain the fact that grief hallucinations kind of get less and less frequent as we get farther from the uh you know the death or even seeings of the dead even if we regard them as non-hallucinatory i gather in the literature they get less and less frequent as with time and it's sort of a gradual tailing off whereas what we see in act one is it's, it's sharp it's not a gradual ta tailing off. You know, he was with them for 40 days, showing them by many infallible proofs until he was taken up from them into heaven. So it's a much sharper distinction that's not going to be well explained by uh, the, the, the paranormal literature. But I think you really see this challenge in the stream where Allison says, you know, He's not a skeptic about the the appearance to the 500. Sean asked him about the appearance to the 500. He's not skeptic about it, but he says, we don't know anything about it. He says, I, I, I don't know whether Jesus was up in the sky. I don't know if he was slightly elevated. I don't know if there was a receiving line. I simply don't know anything about it. So I don't doubt there was some collective experience. I'm just not sure what it was, and I wish I knew more. And that's mm. very telling because... Yes, he's talking about the 500 there, but that could apply to his entire approach to this. You know, mm -hmm. even the appearances to the 12, you know, I'm just not sure what it was like and I wish I knew more. Well, the Gospels are telling you what yeah. the appearance to the 12 was like, but you're taking a scissors to them and, yeah. and, and you're not, not accepting it. This comes out, interestingly, in a um, symposium uh, back in 2007, 2008. Um, when there was a lot more of a tendency to challenge Dr. Allison. So um, I'm trying to remember who all was involved. Gary Habermas, William Lane Craig, Stephen T. Davis. I think those were the three uh, traditional Christians and then Dr. Allison. And they went back and forth. Philosophy of Christie likes to publish these kinds of big symposiums. And um, Dr. Habermas was sort of helping himself to various things about Jesus appearing, you know, um, inside and outside and being referred to as eating food and stuff, which are like way far away from being minimal facts. They're not even second order facts, you know? And this is what Dr. Allison said in his response. As for the accounts of Jesus being touched and eating food, again, can we really establish the origin of those stories, even if they did in fact happen? 
Many scholars, rightly or wrongly, regard the text as legendary, and I cannot see how Gary can argue anything much from them without making a case to the contrary. But how could it be done? I have been reading the secondary literature for a long time, and I do not know. To my knowledge, no one has pulled off the trick yet. Even if the stories are 100% spot on historically accurate how can we show it so if we want to be as critical with the new testament evidence as we are with the apparitional evidence where are we going to end up and that's in in philosophy of christie in 2008 i mean that's like the what we've been saying about the minimal right, fact case right. in a nutshell right there yeah he's basically and this is the thing that i kind of don't understand because um you and i in particular lydia for some reason jonathan everybody likes you so they won't get mad at you <laughs> they get they get mad at us when we point out some of the deficiencies with the minimal facts and yet like Dale Allison is pointing out basically the same thing. And they're, for some reason they want to like christen him and baptize him. And he's a believer now. And I'm like, you, you guys are fighting against the wrong guys here, you know? But um, yeah, I think he's just the poster boy of why there's just so much deficiency with this particular argument with the minimal facts. I, and so, I, I was, I, I was shocked, by the way, in the debate that I alluded to earlier, where Lacuna engaged with Bar Ehrman, the one where he met, where he postulated that uh, Luke changed the geographical setting or location of the appearance, the first appearance of the, the Twelve uh, from Galilee to Jerusalem. In the closing statements, Lacuna gave a shout out to Dale Allison and not only identified him as a Christian believer, but said that after wrestling with the, the, the historical data, Dale Allison came to conclude that Jesus rose from the dead. <laughs> and that, that's just not the impression one gets from reading his published work. Um, I was, I was also surprised. Stream. Go ahead. Yeah, exactly. I was also surprised, incidentally, speaking of this stream, that uh, Sean McDowell is uh, a friend of mine, and I mean no disrespect in, in pointing this out, but... Um, John McDowell in, in the introduction said that Dale Allison's book is one of the best defenses of and at times criticisms of the resurrection. And I, I mean, I don't see anything. Or he said, I think the, what he said was that it's one of the best supports for and at times criticisms of the case for the resurrection. And I, I, I've read Dale Allison's book. I don't see anything in the book that's a support for the resurrection. So I was surprised uh, to see that said. Well, if you have like a really low bar, he's arguing that something something paranormal happened, but that's not what I would call a support for the resurrection. As far as wrestling with the historical data, this bit I quoted earlier where he says, uh, even though this is the center of Christian theology, that doesn't for me mean that you can establish it historically. And it's, it's pretty clear he doesn't think you can establish it historically. In the, in the stream, um, Jack, uh, Sean asked, if someone asked you why are you a christian what would you say because allison regards himself as a christian and you know um dr allison's response was something like well i haven't seen a reason to um abandon what i've been given though i have modified it and then he talked about if if i were a muslim in a muslim country i'd probably be a muslim because parental affiliation is the biggest predictor of um you know, of, of religious belief. So, I mean, that's about as far as you can get from, I'm, I'm a Christian because I've wrestled with the historical <laughs> evidence, which is what Dr. Um, Lacona attributed to him in that closing statement. It, in a lot of this, I'm reminded of a, an old Charlie Brown cartoon where there's a boy named Five and uh, the number Five. And he has, you know, sisters who also have numbers for their names. And Charlie Brown is talking with Five, and Five says, yes, my father believes that our our world is getting way too um, regimented, and everything's numbers all the time, and that's why he gave us these names. And uh, Charlie Brown says, oh, I see. This is his way of protesting. And Five says, no, this is his way of giving in. And I think of that cartoon again and again when I think of some of these things. No, this... This, you know, calling Dr. Allison a fellow believer is uh, is our way of giving in, apparently. And yeah, kind of, you know, bring that. OK, now we'll just call that being a Christian. And and if that's going to be our way of dealing with the weakness of the minimal facts case, I think we should have nothing mm -hmm. to do with it. Yeah. Allison described himself as a pragmatist when it comes to 
epistemology, uh, particularly religious epistemology uh, in the discussion. I was also very surprised, uh, unpleasantly, to see Michael Lacuna um, say that if Muslims had what we have in terms of the evidence that we have for Christianity, and we didn't have that evidence, would he become a Muslim? And he's not sure that he would because he, he doesn't like Islam. And I mean, I, I think that he could have worded that a bit differently. I mean, there's a difference, of course, between uh, affirming that Islam is true versus deciding to worship Allah, just as there is uh, a difference between deciding Christianity is true versus deciding to become a Christian and submit one's life to the Lordship of Christ. But it didn't show a lot of confidence in his case for the resurrection, frankly. I think what he was getting at there, if I recall correctly, I may be misremembering the context. If I recall correctly, I thought what he was getting at was that, you know, there is an influence of worldview upon us. And then he was trying to say, but I've tried really hard in my method to set aside my worldview and the fact that I just don't like Islam or whatever, if I like Christianity better. And yet I still find the the evidence strong. So, you know, I think think that's what he was getting at at that point but i, I could be misremembering right. maybe but, but, but yeah. i think it came across as not having a lot of confidence in the case for christianity that's whether, whether that's what he meant or not listen. that's how it came across yeah, yeah i'd have to go back and listen to it i believe when he was talking about the uh objective vision and bodily resurrection he said something like there's a difference between what we can show absolutely solidly and what i would be inclined to think and what i'm inclined to think is the is the bodily rather than the the objective vision now that i was intrigued in um which doesn't mean he doesn't think that there's an argument but just that he's not treating that as sort of you know bedrock or whatever which i assume is why in the big 2010 book he actually the r the resurrection was the disjunction of either objective vision or bodily resurrection and you really you've you know i think a lot of people read the book and didn't realize that and i was like wow you know i don't think we should use r for but uh you know objective vision at all but but then he did you know he did distinguish them but yeah. that's a little odd but in in responding concerning that in saying why he does in fact believe in the bodily resurrection in the stream, he did run smack up against what we've called the bottleneck problem. Mm -hmm. And I think we can see that mm -hmm. if we run this next clip. Yeah, this is how Mike responds to some of the, the concerns there. So let's check it out. And I'm more inclined to believe that the appearance to the more than 500 was, was more than just some sort of an objective vision. And what leads me to go that way is Paul again, he, he believes resurrection as a bodily event. He believed Jesus' resurrection was a physical bodily event, which would have left behind an empty grave of some sort. Um, and where's he getting this from? You know, he's probably, I, I think he's getting it from the disciples um, and um, the, the nature of their appearances. So I, I'm thinking these earliest Christians believed Jesus had been raised bodily, physically from the dead. And that's one thing on which Bart Ehrman and I agree. They believe that Jesus had been raised bodily, physically from the dead. Now, it, it seems to me then that since this early oral tradition would have been circulating originally in Jerusalem, probably with apostolic origins, um, that it would, and I, I tend, I'm a little bit different than Dale here, I tend to, to can stop right there. All right. So yeah, he's piling on a lot of facts about what the disciples believed. Um, but obviously, Lydia, you've talked about this many times, this bottleneck problem about why just knowing what the disciples believed is not enough. And I think I think that's really where Mike is is banking a lot of it. I I, I think he's convinced that Jesus bodily rose from the dead. I, I think that that that's he that's some a strong conviction of his. Um, but I think he's but at least when he's making a historical case for it, um, he's banking a lot on what they would have believed. And it must have been something amazing. Otherwise, they never would have believed it. Um, and he just gives a lot of different points there. So why don't, why don't you go ahead and address that bottleneck issue is like what it is and, and yeah. how he's kind of falling into that and all that good stuff. Yeah, well, so this is related in a bit in a way to probability theory. And there are a couple different issues here, but the bottleneck issue that, and I've christened it that, um, 
so the probability of the resurrection, given that the disciples believed Jesus rose from the dead in the absence of details about what they experienced, which you can't really get, or what they claim to experience, which you can't really get without digging into the um, the gospel accounts, um, it's going to have a certain value. It's going to have a certain probability. And the word given here in probability theory has to do with treating that uh, thing that's given as having probability one, certainty. So what we do, like if we're running BaseNet software, we flip a switch, we flip that to one. And then like if you've got your consistent BaseNet, everything else gets the values it gets after you flip that to one, given what you've stipulated. So if we're flipping that to one, what we've argued, I've argued this, and Eric and Jonathan, you've both argued this, is that when it's done in the absence of details of what they experienced, it's pretty weak. It would be like, you know, believing that your neighbor sincerely believes that she saw her dead husband, but you don't know why she sincerely believes this, mm -hmm. right? You don't know what her experience was like. Maybe maybe your neighbor moves away before you get a chance to get the whole story. And you're just like, yeah, I grant that she was sincere, but she could be a wackadoodle, you know? Um, so that's, that's why that's weak. And what um, Dr. Lacona does, Dr. Habermas, a lot of other people do this. When you question the bodily resurrection, they go, Oh, but I'm sure they really believe that. Now, that already is not a minimal fact, by the way. That's one of their second order facts, um, but that they really sincerely believed it. But they think that's all they have to say. And they'll literally pile on evidence after evidence after evidence mm -hmm. that they believed it as if they think that answers our concern. The reason it doesn't answer our concern is that we were already flipping it to one. We mm -hmm. were already saying, you know, fine, plug in that it's a probability one certainty they believed it but we have nothing else about why they believe it then there's a problem with our believing it and with our thinking that they were rational in believing it and so just piling more and more evidence we were already past that and it's like we already granted that they believed it we already gave it probability one you can't improve upon probability one yeah so that's the bottleneck issue yeah and he he even kind of brings in Ehrman there and it's like, well, yeah, Ehrman agrees that they believe it, but it's just like, I, I think I've even seen on a, a, a video with like Paula Gia and Bart Ehrman where Bert Ehrman was just like, yeah, so what? They believed it. It it doesn't mean that they had good reasons to believe it. Like even, even he is like very pointedly pointed this out. Um, but yeah, it seems like this is always just something that's added and I'll hear things like, well, you know, they didn't believe that resurrection was something that could happen until the very end of time and there was this mutation of beliefs and they'll kind of bring in a uh an anti rights kind of argument although I'm, I'm not saying it as clearly as probably he does but um that they wouldn't have and it's just more and more of like what they wouldn't have believed and or what would or wouldn't have believed and i, I just again that, it's that assuming just tells their me. rationality Exactly. What you're doing, yeah. what you're doing is you're saying, let's assume they were rational. Well, rational people wouldn't believe this if they didn't have really good experiences. It's like, wait a minute, wait a minute. How many skeptics do you think are going to grant their rationality? If we're yeah. going to talk about assuming things that skeptics are not going to grant, that are not granted by a large majority of scholars, the disciples were rational in believing that Jesus rose from the dead <laughs> is, right. is definitely um, something that is is not going to be granted. Yeah. you know at all and there's an, another point i made recently on facebook that it's it's a little a little difficult it's a sort of probabilistic but we want to try to have a consistent probability network and everybody should try to do that at least have a coherent network for what you're doing so the the minimal facts uh promise is we can grant for the sake of the argument that the Gospels are unreliable and still have a strong argument for the resurrection, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, would you say that's a fair thing to say? Yeah. That's something the <clears throat> minimal facts promises. Not that we necessarily think they're unreliable. You know, maybe the apologists would say, I think they're reliable, but I could grant for the sake of the argument that they're unreliable. Right. And that's because I don't want to get into <clears throat> going up against scholarship. Okay. Yeah. Well, now, Eric, you said something earlier. Um in in this session that um if you're going to grant that they're unreliable what's going to be on the on the chopping block what's going to be on the top five 
things that have been embellished, the resurrection narratives, right? right, right. For sure, especially those physical parts that Dr. Allison, as we pointed out, thinks were embellished. So if you're granting that they're unreliable, even for the sake of the argument, in a way that's meant to avoid arguing with New Testament scholarship, then when you come back and you do this other argument, well, they must have had physical experiences or else they wouldn't have believed Jesus was physically resurrected. Now you have a tension in the probability network because mm -hmm. in your probability network, you supposedly granted that they that the mm -hmm. Gospels are unreliable. We flipped that switch to one. All yeah. right. Now that has all these other implications throughout your probability network. And then even if it's just granted for the sake of the argument, and then you come back and you try to make an argument the other way that they had physical experiences. Well, if the if the resurrection narratives are embellished, that's evidence that they didn't have physical experiences. Exactly. Because right. why would they have felt a need to make stuff up if there were real things they could put in there? <laughs> right. You know, exactly. what, what, are, what are we going to say? Jesus didn't eat fish, but he gave them all high fives. And then <laughs> for some reason, you know, John and Luke said, ah, high fives are uncool. We're going to put that he ate fish instead. And on two different, you know, no, nobody thinks that. Right. But I right. think it just doesn't occur to the minimal facts advocates that the granting that they're unreliable, even for the sake of the argument, is these huge ramifications that are going to run head on into their attempt to argue indirectly in another way that they mm -hmm. had physical bodily like experiences never crosses their mind. And this is where consultation with, uh, you know, someone in epistemology could be helpful. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, one of the things that I've seen with the advocates of the minimal facts that they'll push back on somebody like us, and the one the one criticism that I've seen, I guess, sort of recently is like, well, they got to come up with like a better hypothesis, they got to come up with a better theory. And to me, I'm thinking like, you could just shrug your shoulders like Dale Allison and go, weird stuff happens, weird stuff's out there. I don't know. There's not a lot of details. I don't understand this whole idea from some of these people pushing on minimal facts saying, well, you have to come up with an alternate explanation. When If you don't have the details, why do I even have to come up with an explanation? I could just say, I don't know, and your evidence just isn't good enough. And I, I don't think that that occurs to them. I, I'm, you know, Maybe I'm off base here. Feel free to- No, I think you're right. I do that with Mar some, some of the Marian apparitions. Yeah. You know, I think it may be a result of debate culture that we're thinking of debates. And so whenever we're thinking of debates, we feel like then you can really insist that the person give another theory. But, you know, as you say, Dr. Allison is kind of immune to that kind of pressure, yeah. you know, because his Fortean personality, right? Uh, mm. Weird stuff happens, you know, and he'll just assimilate it to that. And he really believes, I think he really believes that, that weird I, stuff I, does I, happen. I think the debate culture issue also plays into the common concern that's raised against the maximal data approach that it takes too long to say. And the minimal facts approach is far cleaner and it's you can say it in far shorter time because you don't have to get bogged down in uh, defending the substantial veracity of the gospels and, and so forth. And you don't have to go down all these rabbit trails and you can just focus on what majority of scholars grant. And so it's, it's a lot easier to say and it's far more rhetorically effective. That's the the argument that people often make. And as I said in the Sean McDowell discussion, and as Lily has also pointed out, such as in, uh, in her discussion on Cameron Bertuzzi's channel, Capturing Christianity, if, uh, if our critique of the minimal facts case is correct, we don't have a choice but to abandon the minimal facts in favor of a maximal data approach. We, we shouldn't, uh, our primary consideration for which approach to take should be its actual theoretical success in confirming the proposition in question, in this case, the resurrection, not its pragmatic value. Right. Right. Pragmatic right. value is a secondary concern. And and so it, even if it takes longer to make a maximal data approach, we have to adopt a maximal data approach by virtue of its greater uh, theoretical value in actually confirming the proposition which it uh, attempts to confirm. And uh, yeah, so I think that's an, a, a point that's often overlooked. And as we've pointed out many times before, there are ways of presenting a condensed version of the maximal data approach. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you don't have to give a two hour lecture on the reliability of the New Testament. You can be prepared to defend that without necessarily bringing out all of the, uh, all of uh, defending all of the premises in the argument uh, straight up. In fact, the minimal facts approach has the same problem because the person that you are engaging with may not grant some of the minimal facts and you're going to have to back up 
and defend those facts. Um, so, yeah, or yeah. you know, the the person may hone in on this very thing we're saying, like, okay, yeah, lots of scholars claim or a grant that they had appearance experiences, but do you know that that isn't really what you might think it is? And and you know, like a, a canny skeptic right. is going to say um, that's like maybe they didn't even all experience the same thing, you know? Um, maybe it was just like, no offense, Eric, but like a Pentecostal meeting <laughs> where someone <laughs> says, you know, I see Jesus. And somebody else says, I see him too, you know, but they're not even both seeing the, the same thing. Now what we, now we have a group of parents, right? I mean, somebody could really ram that home. And, and Alfred does. Right. In, in fact, also Alfred brings this does. He he in really the discussion of the Marian apparition, he, he, in the discuss, discussion of the Marian apparition, he actually brings this point out that not all of those that purportedly saw the Marian apparition uh, actually saw the same thing. Right. And so just talking about the appearance of the 500 in 1 Corinthians 15 doesn't necessitate that they're all seeing the same thing. So that's another right. vulnerability of basing a large chunk of the argument on 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 7. Well, and basing it on what scholars grant because of the fact of the matter, scholars don't grant all that much. Yeah, I think in his book, he analogizes it to the shaker meetings where people yeah. had ecstasies and that kind of thing. Um, mm -hmm. And that could count as a quote unquote group appearance experience. And once that's pointed out, then if you're in a debate context, you're going to have to have a response to that. Right. And if you're a minimal facts person, you know, what direction are you going to go? Are you going to say, oh, no, I really think that it was more than that. And you're going to maybe cite or quote the gospel accounts. Well, then they're just going to give you the response that, uh, that Dale gave to Gary Habermas that I read from the philosophy of Christie thing. So, you know, ultimately, oh, if he says this, I'm going to have to say this. That's going to happen no matter what you're doing. But but we've really insisted um, that the idea that you're going to have to pause and talk about the census in Luke or something, you know, that's allowing your opponent to control the discourse in a way that no good debater does. You know? Right. Yeah. And I mean, I think it's, it's uh, enough to point out the fact that you do expect some variation in eyewitness testimony. And you could just point out the fact that like a popularizer like Bart Ehrman in his book, Jesus Interrupted, maybe throws out 50 or 60 contradictions. But if you go through them and you look at them, uh, they're just riddled with all kinds of problems, incomplete quotations, um, arguments from silence, uh, just a lot of silliness and shenanigans. And at best, he might have like five or six that are half decent that have received plenty of scholarly treatment. And even if we granted that they were a real contradiction, that's not going to overturn all of the positive evidence um, that we are presenting and, and that it's a privilege to present. It's like some, I think some apologists have this idea that like defending the gospels is like this burden. I've, this, this is kind of a crude illustration here, but I feel like they, they, they treat it as almost like they're, they're our ugly girlfriend or something that we don't want to be <laughs> seen <laughs> out in public, you know, right. <laughs> and like with this person. And it's like, Unfortunately, no, no. they've picked that up, I think, genuinely from some things that have been said by yeah. top line apologists right in that introduction to the third edition of Reasonable Faith. Dr. Mm -hmm. Craig says that someone shouldn't be saddled with defending, yeah, you know, exactly. the reliability of the Gospels. And that's a, that's a shame, yeah, you know, to right. say that. Because unfortunately, we're, we have a generation of people, including apologists, who just have no idea how to defend the Gospels and Acts because they've never felt they had to, and they've never been given a robust treatment of this topic. And and so I think that's where the value of your books, Lydia, comes in, is that it actually exposes people to some of the best arguments for the robust reliability of the Gospels and Acts. Yeah, yeah. They've, they've lost access to those tools. Um, and, and, and to the point where I think it's actually encouraged doubt about the public defensibility. You know, it's one thing to say, yeah, 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 as a Christian, I believe that they're reliable, but uh, that this can actually be, you know, publicly defended. I did something on Apologetics 315 with um, Brian Auten, and I can't remember the name of his co-host, but... Ch um, Chad, Chad something. Chad, Chad, yes. Chad Gross, I want to say. Yeah, mm -hmm. and and uh, one or the other of them said, yeah, we've all been taught, you know, 
minimal packs. Here's your here's your gun. Here are your bullets. Here are your you know your three minimal packs. Go for it. And that's what we've done. And and maybe this has caused us to become weak, so that we you know we we haven't even we haven't even built up that ability to to defend. So they actually spontaneously said that. Yeah. I wanted to make one more comment about Bart Ehrman. Um, he used to be thought to have granted that there were group appearances, but it's become clear that he does not grant that. Mm. Um, that became clear on a post on his um, blog that, you know, you pay to be a member. And then I saw that post and I asked a question in the comments and he confirmed that he does not grant that there were group appearances at all, but that if there were, then they were like, seeing at a distance like a Marian apparition. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was really good to bring that out. Um lest anyone ever say, you know, Bart Ehrman Grant's group appearances. So yeah, no, and I think that's important. And so I think we should probably take a look um at how Allison would respond to the argument um about Lacona and how he would uh, apply the questions to the nature of the disciples' own experience. So um I'll go ahead and Cue up that clip here. Uh, um, to push back a little bit, Paul puts his own account at the end of this list. And uh, you said Fair earlier enough. that you think Fair enough. that his experience in Acts looks like a vision. Actually, it calls it a vision, right? At, at one point, it's yeah. his heavenly vision. So if Paul can do that, I'm not sure why why other people can't do that. And the other the other thing is, is that you know, as I argue in one chapter of the book, I I think we should pay some attention to the fact that Christians down through the ages have had visions of, of Jesus, and it still goes on. And most of those people who have visions of Jesus think that he rose from the dead and think that the tomb was empty and that he rose bodily, but they will still have no trouble saying that Jesus appeared to them and uh, that for them, this is proof that he is still alive. Uh, so I, th I think once you, you believe in the resurrection, that you can take appearances as confirmation that Jesus still lives and confirmation of your belief in resurrection, but not every appearance has to be uh, physical. So a little pushback there. Yeah, I think that's fair, Dale. I think that's a fair answer, good answer. I, I was really surprised at uh, Lacona's response there. That's a that's a good answer. It's a fair answer with no pushback to what Allison said. As, as I yeah. said earlier uh, in this video, uh, you you can in fact make a robust argument that Paul's experience was, which does have vision like qualities, so we can grant that that it, that it was qualitatively different from what the other apostles experienced, uh, as and the way that I would make the argument the primary way i would make the argument would be to show that acts was written by someone who was a traveling companion of paul and was very familiar with paul's uh gospel and his and was in a position to know what the purported eyewitnesses of the resurrection were contending and um and, and so I, I was surprised to see a lacuna just say oh yeah that's a good point with no pushback. And I think that's indeed yeah. a, another vulnerability of the minimal facts approach. I mean, how do you decisively justify that from the perspective of a minimal facts theorist? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. to me, it was a huge concession. Yeah, yeah. I just was gonna say it's a huge concession. So go, go ahead, Lydia, what were you gonna no, say? No, it really draws attention to, to the problem because um, where I would start talking about kind of what Jonathan is talking about and the very sharp distinction between bodily appearances during those 40 days and appearances after Jesus was no longer on earth. Um, you know, of, of course, we don't expect Jesus to be having a meal with the Apostle Paul. He went back to heaven, right? And that's clearly how Luke thinks about it. That's clearly how the author of Acts thinks about it. Acts 1 makes that quite clear. Um, but, but that's not accessible. I mean, I think Dr. Lacona is being consistent with his historical bedrock approach because it's certainly not accessible as historical bedrock uh, or minimal facts that um, there was this extremely sharp difference even between the disciples' claims 
about what happened before and then Jesus ascended and what happened after. And, what, you know, I think they were out there saying, well, you know, we didn't drank with him, but then he went back to heaven. And then our brother Stephen, while he was dying, saw him in a vision and he appeared to our brother Paul uh, from the heavens on the road to Damascus. I think that's how they would have expressed it. And you can tell that from Acts, but that's not anywhere near historical bedrock or a minimal fact. So he, he didn't have that available to him to to push back. Right. And, and one other point I'd make is that um, I, I do think that Paul's experience on the on the road to Damascus, where he encounters the risen Jesus, I do think that it has evidential value yes. in confirming the resurrection and the de Christianity. It might not be as strongly um, uh, vertical as that of the other apostles, but it certainly, I think, goes a long way uh, towards establishing the truth of Christianity. And uh, for more information on that, I'd refer viewers to George Littleton's excellent book. Uh, observations on the conversion of St. Paul. Um, he actually was a skeptic, a deist, who, uh, during the, the deist controversy, he actually converted um, as a result of this evidence of the conversion of the Apostle Paul. I would actually argue that the account of which we read in Acts 9 um, actually reflects Paul's own testimony about his experience. Uh, so in Acts uh, 9, we, we read that um, now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him and falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So he it's not only a visual component, but also an auditory component. And he said, who are you, Lord? And, he's, and he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Uh, and so here's where some of the evidential value comes in, is that this individual who communicates and converses with Paul confirms the um, the the church, the, the message that's proclaimed by the church that Paul is persecuting. Uh, he says, but rise and enter the city and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. So they, the tra traveling companions of Saul of Tarsus apparently also have some sort of experience, although they don't see uh, the individual with whom Paul is conversing. And so that's why I say that it has vision-like elements, even though it was a veridical experience. But notice that he is blinded by the experience. Verse 8, Saul rose from the ground, although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. So he's blinded, and then he's later healed by Ananias. And if that does indeed reflect Paul's own testimony, it's the sort of testimony about which it's quite difficult to be honestly mistaken. And it seems that Paul was at least sincere in making uh, those statements, because uh, if you read throughout his letters, uh, especially 2 Corinthians 11, uh, you can also read about it in 1 Thessalonians, you can read about it in the pastoral letters, 2 Timothy 4, for example, um, that uh, Paul suffered tremendous persecution. Read about it in Clement of Rome as well, in section five of First Clement, also in Luke's account in Acts. And so that goes a long way towards establishing that he was at least sincere. And um, William Paley also in his uh, Horror Polonae documents several uh, examples of undesigned coincidences pertaining specifically to Acts 9, uh, which indicates that Luke is probably receiving this information from a reliable source, and the most plausible candidate there would be the Apostle Paul himself, because he was Paul's traveling companion. So, for instance, mm -hmm. in uh, Galatians 1, um, verse 17, he mentions that um, that um, after the experience where uh, Jesus had appeared to him, he says that uh, he, in verse 16, he didn't immediately consult with anyone. Verse 17, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went away into Arabia and returned again to Damascus. And uh, William Paley points out, he says, and I quote, he says, beside the difference observable in the terms and general complexion of these two accounts, the journey into Arabia mentioned in the epistle and omitted in the history affords full proof that there existed no correspondence between these writers. If the narrative of the Acts had been made out from the epistle, it's impossible this journey should have been passed over in silence. If the epistle had been composed out of what the author had read of St. Paul's history in the Acts, it is unaccountable that it should have been inserted. Um, in this quotation from the epistle, I desire to be remarked how incidentally it appears that the affair passed at Damascus in what may be called the direct part of the, the account. No mention is made of the place of his conversion at all. A casual expression at the end and an expression brought in for a different purpose alone fixes it to have been at Damascus. I returned again to Damascus. Nothing could be more like simplicity and undesignedness than this is. It also draws the agreement between the two quotations somewhat closer to observe that they both state St. Paul to have preached the gospel immediately upon his call, and straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God, Acts chapter 9, verse 20. Uh, when it, and then he quotes from Galatians 1, 15, when it pleased God to reveal the Son in me that I might preach to him among the heathen, immediately I can confer not with flesh and blood. 
And so, um, and he also mentions uh, that St. Peter's visit to Antioch, during which the dispute arose between them and St. Paul, which is in Galatians 2, is not mentioned in the Acts. So that's addressed the independence of the accounts, and thus that Luke is most plausibly getting this from a credible source. And there are, other, of course, other examples as well um, that that um, vote favorably for that proposition. Uh, 1 Corinthians 9, for example, mentions, uh, sorry, 1 Corinthians, um, uh, 1 Corinthians uh, sorry, um, 2 Corinthians 11, I'm thinking of, um, mentions uh, the, uh, the, the the plot to seize Paul at um, Damascus and mentions that the governor under King Aratus was guarding the city of Damascus in order to seize me. But uh, and he mentions being let down in the basket uh, in a win um, through, a bat through a window in, a, in the wall, which correlates, of course, with Acts nine. But there's no mention in Acts nine of King Aratus. It's the Jews that seek to kill him. So obviously there was some sort of conspiracy going on there. Um, and of course, Second uh, Corinthians doesn't mention Ty uh, mentions Titus everywhere. There's, Many places where Titus is mentioned is not mentioned in Acts. Uh, Paul's trials listed in Second Corinthians 11 also cannot be readily correlated with Acts. And so there's ample evidence for thinking that these are independent accounts, and yet they converge upon particular details concerning Paul's conversion experience. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, I wrote a post, too, called A Maximalist Use of the Conversion of Paul, a short post. And, you know, as I'm thinking back, I can't even remember if I said everything that I could have said there to this effect that, um, the evidential value of Paul's experience depends in large measure on it's not being vague. And I think mm -hmm. that's um, what you were bringing out there, Jonathan. And, and we find this with contemporary miracles, contemporary vision claims as well. You know, think how much weaker it would be if Paul just said, um, you know, I, I became a Christian because I just had this really strong feeling that Jesus was talking to me and um, saying that I shouldn't persecute the, the church. And like, if that were it, right, I just had a really strong feeling. It wouldn't be worth anywhere near as much. Now, Acts can be beautifully defended in so many ways as mm -hmm. to its its accuracy and closeness to the facts. Um, but that's certainly taking a maximalist approach to Acts. So if we're going to grant the conversion of St. Paul to have um, evidential value, which I would agree with Jonathan, it does, that that works on a maximalist approach, but doesn't really work very well on a minimalist approach. Um, yeah, I would definitely. emphasize also concerning what Allison says there in that clip, he's, he's very clever. I mean, it's very, it's a shrewd kind of comment um, because he's he's eliding something, he's leaving something out, maybe not even deliberately. Um, but it, and it is this, yes, Christians down through the ages have believed that they have had visions and have taken these visions to be confirmation of Jesus' resurrection. And that includes Paul. But those Christians down through the ages have taken it, have believed maybe through, in Paul's case, actually talking to the apostles or with the other Christians from reading the gospels, that the disciples claim to have had very strong non-vision-like experiences. So there's a premise there, you know, I think this confirms Christianity. And what I mean by Christianity is the stuff that those guys were preaching after those guys said they had that kind of experience. And if, if you say that all of them were visionary experiences, then all of these people who thought that had a false premise. Right. They were making a major mistake. If we really thought that the disciples had no more strongly bodily an experience than Paul did, then that would downgrade the value of Paul's experience as well, mm -hmm. because it would mean that whatever his experience was confirming, it couldn't have been confirming uh, Jesus eating bodily and being bodily with the Christians uh, here on earth after his resurrection because there it didn't happen okay so um you know he's he's just kind of he's just kind of jumping over that fact that the reason people take these visions or vision like experiences to confirm christianity is because they in part because they think there were some people who had something better than vision like experiences and so that makes it that's crucial to the um you know, soundness uh, of their argument. Mm 
Mm -hmm. Right. So that's it's a kind of an important point. And that's something that I think a maximalist could really draw attention to in replying to what Dale said there rather than just saying, hey, that's a good point. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. There is far, far less than uh, things that we would need to concede at all. It's just mm -hmm. it's just night and day. And so, um, Jonathan, you mentioned when you were with Sean that the minimal facts of uh, proponents sometimes bring in things that don't meet the extremely high consensus. I think it's like 90% or something like that, mm -hmm. um, which is like the official requirement for a minimal fact. And it's got to be accepted throughout liberal scholars, conservative scholars, a heterogeneous consensus. Um, and you mentioned that the empty tomb and group appearances, um, but supposedly those have a pretty fairly high degree of scholarly consensus. I think it's like Habermas says it's like 70% or something like that. Um, so a minimal facts proponent might want to loosen the consensus requirement somewhat to include these uh, next level facts or second order facts, whatever you want to call them, but still not defend the reliability of the Gospels. And so uh, how much uh, would that do to address the epistemic issues that we're talking here? Yeah, so <clears throat> as for the group experiences, I'm not convinced, by the way, that that the level of acceptance among New Testament scholars is as high as 70 or 80 percent for the group experiences is that your sense also lydia would you um it, it is especially when but I, you know i could be wrong but especially if you don't include you know the uh the shaker meeting version you know <laughs> where you know they they they're just sort of having heavy feelings or whatever right. you know um but an actual you know something visual i also unfortunately have found that in some cases where dr habermas has cited a specific scholar and i've gone and looked up that scholar he is interpreting overly optimistically right. so you know in 2021 dr lacona said that um between that Lacona said that Habermas said that between 75 and 85 percent of critical scholars grant group appearances mm -hmm. and that that does surprise me but um you know let's suppose that it were true I'm not convinced right. that it, it answers our problem so yeah. go ahead absolutely um so as I pointed out in the interview with Sean and, and elsewhere and Lydia's pointed out as well that there's even an epistemic bottleneck when it comes to the group experiences because uh Again, we have the Marian apparitions, uh, and uh, as Dale Allison points out, not all of them even claim to have seen the same thing. And so unless we can say something objective about what the experiences are supposed to have been like, uh, even, if they're, even if we're talking about group experiences, then you cannot, it doesn't matter if we grant it a probability of one, you still cannot robustly justify confidence that Jesus, in fact, was raised from the dead. So, I, I, and, and certainly even granting uh, the empty tomb, I mean, there's other explanations that could explain the empty tomb, the theft, tomb theft hypothesis, for example. Um, and so I, I still think that you are going to have to show that the resurrection experiences were uh, sufficiently similar to what we find in the Gospels and Acts in order to have a robust case for the bodily resurrection of Jesus right or you know rainbow bodies right i mean you know maybe that's why the tomb was empty i mean i don't i think that's all nonsense i've done a series on rainbow bodies but part of what i've been emphasizing there is the difference between you know the the evidence um yeah. even of appearances i think one of those guys supposedly appeared to people in dreams but right. not exactly. you know not not physically not bodily or i think one of them said they thought they felt him touch their sleeve or tug on their sleeve but it was completely it was only one person and so there's all kinds of you know all kinds of issues there and i think what jonathan's getting at there is that we've been sort of almost assuming some of these that okay suppose we let you have some of these second order facts um mm -hmm. you know early belief in the physical resurrection um empty tomb some kind of group appearances. And we've been making our critique even against the background of those second order facts already, you know? So it's not like you're gonna get yourself past this critique by adopting those second order facts. We've been sort of like almost letting you have that and then showing that there's there's still a problem because otherwise it's like really hopeless. If you don't have, if you don't have an empty tomb, you don't have any group appearances, you know, you don't have an early physical resurrection belief, then it becomes kind of, you know, like it's just another kooky religion, 
uh, right. at that point. So yeah, and and, and as, as Lydia has also pointed out and, and brought my attention to this too, um, the appearance uh, the appearances could even be in certain circumstances evidence against the bodily resurrection of Jesus. Because imagine that the experiences are like a floating Jesus who hovers above the ground and you move your hand to touch the wound in his side and your hand passes right through or something like that. Well, I mean, of course, Dale Allison is sympathetic to the paranormal. So Lacona's minimal facts approach or historical bedrock approach is particularly vulnerable to this critique from someone like an Allison who's sympathetic to the paranormal. Uh, and so, if you, again, you cannot robustly justify belief in the bodily resurrection of Jesus unless you also are able to bring in facts that we derive from the Gospels and Acts. Yeah, it would, in that case, be more reasonable to believe that it was a paranormal event. Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, and, as opposed to an ordinary bodily resurrection. So, yeah. now, one of these second-order facts is the appearance to James. And I think it would be fun to talk a little bit about that. I recently, in talking to Tim, I referred to the appearance to James as Schrodinger's fact. Um, in the, um, and that's a, that's a pun. Anyway, you know, because it appears and disappears like Schrodinger's cat. Um, yeah, yeah. Sometimes it's in the case and sometimes it's not in the case. And so um, a phrase that uh, Dr. Uh, Lacona likes to use is, friends and foes alike or mm -hmm. jesus appeared to two skeptics or he appeared to skeptics plural so one of the skeptics is obviously paul right or the foes <laughs> who's the other one or who are the other ones i i think we've got to be talking about james the brother of jesus there i don't think he means thomas because that's definitely way far from being a minimal yeah. fact that's so far away and so, he's not a foe he's, he's a skeptic and he's not really not a foe a either but you could right. call him a skeptic i guess i'm not even sure james was a foe i think he just thought his his older brother was getting a little uppity i mean that you know his brother just kind of didn't like him and didn't believe on him um but what is the evaluation of that so why is that a second order fact in dr uh, lacona's big resurrection book what he says is of the scholars who address it, 90% or more say they think there was an appearance to James. But I couldn't find a lot of scholars who addressed it. So in other words, it's not like it's not like a very big sample size, right? Um, and so I think that was a legitimate point given their method, right? If you only have a few scholars who even address it, then saying that 90% of those um, think that there was some kind of an appearance to James is, is really not saying very much, even from the, the perspective where you're making a big deal out of consensus. But uh, Dr. Habermas is more fond of bringing it in. So, you know, what they'll kind of do is say, look how scrupulous we are. We're not even counting the appearance to James as a minimal fact. And then, you know, five minutes later, <laughs> and he appeared to at least two skeptics, you know, or at least two right. enemies, you know. And uh, so it's it's questionable where it even belongs, you know, in the argument. But the other thing is that Dr. Allison thinks that Jesus maybe appeared to James because it's in the list in Paul's 1 Corinthians 15, but he does not grant at all that, that it's what converted James. Right. So the appearance to James is not the same thing necessarily as the conversion of James by the appearance and in fact allison just hammers that in the book that the apologetical use is based on something we cannot know etc and on uh, minimal facts you can't respond with what we've been talking about here concerning the ascension and try to argue that it makes more sense that the appearance to james occurred before the ascension because he's there at pentecost with his you know with his mother and that kind of distinction because that's not something you're in a robust position to defend it's, it's even uh, a contested matter among conservative scholars, whether James, in fact, was a skeptic prior to his conversion. So Richard Balcom, for example, uh, doesn't believe that, Jesus, that, that James was a skeptic uh, before his conversion. And uh, he discusses that, as I recall, in Jesus and their witnesses. Um, and so it, it's not even a minimal fact uh, by any stretch that the conversion of James or that or that the appearance of James resulted in James's conversion. And I think it was, right? And right. Tim and I uh, 
talk about that briefly. I think in the in our resurrection article, we take James to be one of the witnesses and so forth, so forth. But you have to really go a lot farther than the minimal facts to, you know, to defend this. And I noticed in the stream, Dr. Lacuna was using um, he was using chronology. So like the appearance to the 500 is mentioned after the appearance to James, but the appearance to James converted him. So it probably took place before Pentecost. So therefore the appearance to the 500 probably took place before Pentecost. Well, I follow his reasoning, but his reasoning is not going to hold given that blurring of that whole distinction that Dr. Allison is inclined to make where it's just like, they're all vision like in, in quality. So, you know, why would that convert anybody, right? You know, right. well, in the case of Paul, we know why that would convert anybody. Because again, we know these very striking details. It's daytime. He's not dreaming. He's just walking along the road. All of a sudden, wham, he gets, you know, knocked to the ground, bright light, etc. That's why that converted Paul. But if we don't know very much else about it, then it's legitimate to ask why a visionary experience would be um, converting in, in nature. Hmm. Well, yeah, there's obviously we've covered a lot of different things here. And so I thought we should um, we could probably wrap up with some maybe some closing thoughts. Um, obviously, this isn't I always feel like the situation like like the bad guys because I'm busting a balloon of a, a favorite argument um, that has really just become popular and I think is just taking kind of a footing for the last 10 or 20 years. Um, and so, but really something more like a max data approach was more popular really up until then, until this kind of sociological fact of like, well, let's just grant everything that the skeptic can say about the gospels and we could still prove it. You know, like I got one arm tied behind my back, you know, let's, let's go. Um, and so, um, so yeah, I just wanted to kind of get your, your takes on that. And then what can we do better? Um, what advice would you have for apologists who want to defend the resurrection going forward? Um, and one common thing that I hear a lot too is, well, can I just do both? Can I use both somehow? Mm -hmm. um, and so maybe touch on that and then we'll we'll wrap up here. Yeah, I, I, I don't think that the two methodologies are compatible because the minimal facts approach argues that you can justify belief in the resurrection without using the gospels and acts. It's not that it's like the introduction and then the maximal data is like the meat and potatoes. No, the, you're supposed to be able to justify belief in the resurrection, indeed, indeed strong confidence in the resurrection on the basis of the minimal facts approach. And so if you cannot do that, then the best approach is to throw out the minimal facts and replace it with a maximal data approach. I think that unfortunately, a lot of Christians um, are have, have a naivete about how much contemporary critical scholars actually do grant about the resurrection quote unquote facts. So um, the, the group experiences, for example, the uh, certainly the consensus of critical scholars doesn't grant that the experiences were anything like what we find in the Gospels and Acts. Um, and so that being the case, I mean, why, why switch the criteria midway through the argument? Why, why not start with right. uh, asserting up front that the Gospels and Acts are based on the testimony of eyewitnesses who are close up to the facts? Um, in the habit of being truthful and well informed, and that being the case, then we can uh, we can argue and justify that the statements in the Gospel of the Acts concerning the nature and variety of the resurrection encounters with the risen Jesus actually reflect the testimony of those who were purportedly eyewitnesses of the resurrection. And we can argue from Acts and other sources, the Pauline Corpus, um, etc., that uh, First Clement uh, that there was a context of persecution. Um, where the early apostles were willing to voluntarily undergo and be subject to um, imprisonments, hardships, labors, dangers, um, in some cases martyrdom, on account of their testimony of the resurrection. And that goes a long way towards establishing that, that their sincerity. And there's also other arguments that, uh, that support that conclusion, such as the fact that the all four Gospels independently use women as the chief discoveries of the empty tomb, and given the status of women in first in first century uh, patriarchal society of, of ancient Israel, where the testimony of women is worth a fraction of that of a male witness, and they were considered reliable witnesses. That's surprising if the story is being made up and fictionalized. There are other arguments as well. And then 
when you look at the nature and variety of the resurrection of Kenner is reported in the Gospels and Acts, is not the sort of set of testimonies about which is easy to be honestly mistaken. And so, um, and then also the fact that Christ was raised from the dead in all four Gospels and on the first day of the week, which corresponds to the Feast of First Fruits, and uh, given that Christ is supposed to be the first fruits from among the dead, the guarantor, if you will, of the, of the general resurrection at the end of time, um, and the fact that Leviticus 23 indicates that the first fruits feast is to be celebrated the day following the first Sabbath following Passover, which is the first day of the week or the Sunday, um, and the fact that the early church universally, um, without exception, as far, as far as we can tell, mo or monolithically, uh, and very, very from very, very early on, changed their sacred day from the Sabbath to the Lord's day, the first day of the week, uh, as we can tell from various church fathers, as well as um, Revelation and the Pauline Corpus and uh, the Book of Acts. That suggests that there's design going on here. Um, and so that, again, points away from the honestly mistaken hypothesis. And so the best explanation then at the end of the day is that Jesus, in fact, rose from the dead. And I think that's a far more robust case than limiting ourselves to the minimal facts approach. And I think, as we've said before, we shouldn't feel a burden. We shouldn't think it a burden to defend the Gospels and Acts. Rather, we should count it a privilege because the evidence is on our side. Right? The evidence yeah. is very, very strongly supportive and confirmatory of the strong reliability of the gospel next of grounding an eyewitness testimony and i like that what lydia says in the appendix of hidden in plain view that we should adopt the i think she says it in the eye of the beholder as well that we should adopt the forward position and uh, not be on the defensive all the time but actually asserting the positive case for christianity rather than impoverishing our generation with a half-baked case that leaves out a lot of the most compelling data simply because we bow to what scholars say or don't Mm -hmm. So a little history here in relation to what you said, uh, Eric, there. Um, I think, oddly enough, that the minimal facts case got its kickoff partly because of excitement with a, a somewhat more quote-unquote conservative movement among liberal scholars. Mm -hmm. And so I think what happened was, you know, like that acknowledgement that the first Corinthians 15 thing might be early and go back to an earlier um, mm -hmm. case, or, um, you know, you had some sort of moderate liberal scholars like Dodd. Okay. Mm -hmm. You know, CH Dodd. And, and so people were doing these things that were somewhat more moderate compared to the more extreme skepticism previously. And I think Dr. Habermas and some other people got really excited and it was sort of like, well, they're coming this direction. How can we make use of that? And this led to this inspiration, you know, like maybe the way we can use that is maybe since they're now granting more than they were granting before, we can make our case for Christianity just using what they're granting now, mm -hmm. you know? And so that concept took over the apologetic world, I think, in part because of a, somewhat of a movement in liberal scholarship. And I think one thing we can do better is to stop feeling like we need to refer to things that aren't really all that exciting as if they're really exciting. How many presentations have you seen where people go on and they announce it on Twitter and they they, they go on and on about um, how many scholars grant that Jesus was crucified? Yeah. <laughs> it just kills me. Wow. It just kills me. It's like, it's like, yay. I mean, how many other people were crucified? And I don't think any of them rose from the dead, you know? Mm, and right. and this is like supposed to be part of the case for Jesus' resurrection. Well, you know, obviously he has to die before he can be raised. But unless you're talking to Everyone a Muslim. Everyone dies. Somebody. Right, right. You no, know, he died. <laughs> unless you're talking to a Muslim or a mythicist, it's not a big deal to defend that Jesus died and he was crucified. So um, mm. that's something we need to stop doing. The minute you catch yourself writing up a you know, an infographic or a tweet or something that's like a large majority of scholars grant that Jesus performed deeds, which his followers took to be miracles. I mean, how many charlatans right. is that true yeah. of, right? Yeah. Stop and ask yourself, am I making a big deal about something that's not really a big deal? And and when you break out of that, that that's going to help. Um Another reason why I don't think the minimal facts can be a lead in to the max data is because when you admit how little there is to be excited about in the appearance fact, it sounds like it's not worth stating. Okay, so if you say a very, very large 
you know, percentage of scholars believe that the disciples had some kind of experiences which caused them to conclude that he rose from the dead. Just some kind. We don't know anything about what these were like. And a lot of those very same scholars think they were pretty, pretty crappy experiences. You know, they, right, right. they were okay. If you're really being honest with your audience like that, you're going to recognize the rhetorical complete ineffectiveness in starting with the minimal facts. It's going to look awful, you yeah. know? And so then the third thing I would suggest that people do before they say, well, I'm just going to have to stop doing apologetics then because this is impossible. I can't do this is, you know, don't do that. Have stuff in your pocket. You're going to want to have a few things in your pocket. Read some books, read some old apologists, read, um, you know, some of some of my books, read Paley, read um, Can We Trust the Gospels by um, Peter Williams, read, you know, some things like that, Historical Reliability of John's Gospel by Craig Blomberg, and just get, get a few things. Now, that's what we're all doing. I mean, that's an actually well-known way to approach convincing somebody hmm. is that you don't have to know everything. You right. just have to know a few things that you've rehearsed, that you're confident in bringing forward, that you take to be representative. I mean, Eric, you've worked directly in sales. You don't think that the salesman has to know everything that there is to be known about no. that product. Right, but he needs right. to have things that he's comfortable bringing out that he feels he knows well enough to bring out. And I would say that regarding Max Data as well, regarding defending the reliability of the Gospels. Um, if you get as comfortable with a, a few undesigned coincidences, um, a few of the types of arguments for the reliability of the Gospels, as, as you're already comfortable with the minimal facts, then you're going to know, you're going to come to learn how to use that tool and use that weapon. You can never learn how to use a tool until you actually get out there and and work on using it. Sitting around saying, I could never do it, you're going to get nowhere. Yeah, I was just chatting with somebody the other day, and we were talking about a, a certain situation where somebody sounded very burdened, like, oh, gosh, I have to learn all these facts about gospel reliability. And me and this other individual were like, man, I don't know about you, but my experience was like, this was very liberating, um, that there was so many different things that um, confirm historicity of the gospels that it's actually very exciting uh, to learn all these different things. And so, I mean, even with my my sons, I have a 15 year old and a 13 year old, and we're, we're going through um, your husband, Tim's uh, IAP lecture, where he gives like, I think five external confirmations. Um, and then he gives like five undesigned coincidences. And he's, he, you know, Tim, he's always got the little acronyms and stuff. Um, and so, and, and they love it. They think it's very interesting. And we just, we'll just camp on one and we'll just talk about, I'll let him talk for five or 10 minutes about that one fact. And then I'll just kind of expand upon it with them. And then, you know, that's just, that's just part of their homeschool. Okay. So if, if my two teenage sons can can learn some of this stuff then i don't see why it's that difficult i'm not expecting him to to know everything and but like you said but um just to give them a handful of things especially when you have like a little acrostic that you can memorize these things um i mean it, it shouldn't be if we're talking to apologist we, we you shouldn't have to apologize for making them think and do work. <laughs> um, yeah, that's what this is about. It's it's and so I just find that kind of a uh, panic and pushback to just be really strange when these are also the same people that will sit and spend um, months studying something like the ontological argument, um, which I think is kind of pretty much worthless. But anyways, we'll leave that <laughs> alone. <laughs> but but then like you know learn some history. It's just like. You know, it's just like right. It, it, something's obviously wrong when the the very richness and wealth of the evidence is taken as a a, a strike against giving yeah. the evidence. You know, yeah. the wealth of the evidence means that there's there's something there for everybody. Like with the undesigned coincidences, some people are going to find one of them more forceful than another. So mm. that's why I say find things that you mm. can get excited about, that you can present, and then and then work at it and practice doing it. And and that should be fine. There's nothing um, 
there's nothing impossible about that at all. Um, and nobody's saying that you have to that you have to know everything. And also nobody's saying you have to give it all in a five minute conversation. But just be ready with one thing to come back. You know, you think about these uh, street apologists, right? When they say, well, why do you think Christianity is true? Right. And a lot of times a person would be ready, uh, you know, to stand up against I'm, I'm talking about the skeptic street epistemology yeah, yeah. and to not be thrown by that if they just even had three things hmm. that they could say, you know, and then say, and there's a lot more or something like that. Yeah. You wouldn't be helpless prey, you know, for that. Yeah. Yeah. Have a few facts and then be like, hey, these are some good books that I recommend. And, you know, or, or there's even good, you know, online resources that you could get a hold of for free if you can't do that. And so. Yeah, well, I thank you guys so much for this conversation, and um, I know that this is just the reason why, again, we address these things is because the resurrection, as far as I'm concerned, you can't get a higher stakes issue than this. And so while I personally appreciate, you know, the the shepherdly and uh, evangelistic kind of heart of some of the minimal facts proponents, um, we're not poking holes in their argument because of anything personal. Um, we're just trying to show that Christians, there's a better way um that that will take you way further down the road and i think the whole thing that provoked this conversation with sean mcdowell jonathan was is we get people who watch these things online and they're aware of minimal facts but these skeptics right. these doubters these doubting christians are troubled by the the limitations of the answers that they're getting from minimal facts and, um and so that's what provokes me it's it's not like i want views and clicks it's that i'm dealing with these people <laughs> and that are having doubts and I want to help them and give them the best information. And I see the lights come on when we're able to give some of these, these facts and point them to these resources that we've discussed. Right. Exactly. And we, we actually had one person, uh, obviously I won't say their name, but we had one person uh, that we talked to through talk about doubts.com who had watched the discussion between Lacuna and Allison and had been very troubled by how Allison had been able to punch holes through Lacuna's arguments and it completely rocked their faith because it always clung to the resurrection of Jesus as a linchpin in their argument for Christianity. And so I, that I think underscores why this is an important discussion to have and why it's mm -hmm. important to put forward an alternative case. And, and why we have an evangelistic heart, all of us too, mm -hmm. right. you know, like we are all aiming to, to bring people to Christ and to strengthen people in their faith. And it, it definitely shouldn't be thought that, you know, people who are doing the minimal facts, they've got an evangelist's heart. And we over here are just kind of coldly living up in our ivory tower or something <laughs> and picking nits. It, it really, it, it really is for a more practical reason and concern. Yeah, absolutely. We're not just you know, wasting our time here talking about these things. There are serious epistemological issues here um, that just have to be addressed. And if Christians can't discuss these things, uh, they can argue with each other all the time about the age of the earth and, um, and all of these other things. But um, what is more important than this? And so we should be able to discuss these things. And so hopefully there's more discussion and response um, from, from the advocates of that side. And so um, we'll, we'll see. And so, uh, thank you guys again for joining us on this broadcast. Um, definitely check out Lydia's channel. Um, and, um, there's just a lot of good stuff there. Check out her blog. I'll be sure to link the, uh, maximal use of Paul article that we discussed. Uh, and then definitely check out, um, Jonathan talk about doubts. You can see it on the hat there. Talk about doubts.com, uh, that we have alluded to. Um, we do one-on-one -on -one zoom calls and, uh, Council, he's got so many different people helping him, so many different volunteers. How many volunteers do you got now? John, we have over like 60 people. 60 people, yeah. yeah. Uh, so it's awesome. I've been able to be a part of it. Uh, it's it's an honor and a privilege to just, like I said, see the lights come on. Um, and so if you are somebody who um, has doubts, uh, definitely do not hesitate to reach out. Also be sure to check out jonathanmcclatchy.com. Tons of really good articles on the reliability of the Gospels and Acts and um, other, you know, related issues, uh, intelligent design, arguments for the existence of God, um, 
but a lot of focus on uh, obviously gospel reliability, fulfilled prophecy, uh, your stuff on the, uh, the Trinity in the Old Testament, I just find extremely fascinating. And so just tons of good resources there. And so thanks everybody again for watching.